The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Robert Mueller exonerates Trump on collusion, but leaves a lovely parting gift for Democrats on obstruction of justice. Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com, and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. So the Mueller report is out, and we'll examine it from a number of angles, the trail of obstruction breadcrumbs left by the special counsel, whether Trump was saved from himself by his associates, whether his fury over the investigation was justified, and where we go from here. We'll be joined by LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza. Plus, an alternate and more plausible theory of why the Russians interfered in the election. Did it really have to do with Trump or with Hillary Clinton? Plus, our signature segment, Say What?, featuring Nancy Pelosi on whether the Democrats have become a socialist party and the meteoric rise of the Democratic presidential candidate known as Mayor Pete. The top ten, the left might come to call them. Nothing to see, the right will certainly say. But whether legitimate or not, the ten occurrences included in the Mueller report, which could have added up to potential obstruction of justice by President Trump, but did not, represent the special counsel's lovely parting gift to Democrats. These top ten include Trump's behavior regarding Michael Flynn, the FBI investigation, his firing of James Comey, his ruminations about firing the special counsel, and the matter of that Trump Tower meeting with a Russian woman in 2016. And these revelations encapsulate exactly why prosecutors do not release information about investigations into individuals not charged with crimes. Barr spoke about Trump's fury through this whole process. There is substantial evidence to show that the president was frustrated and angered by his sincere belief that the investigation was undermining his presidency, propelled by his political opponents and fueled by illegal leaks. As he entered into office and sought to perform his responsibilities as president, federal agents and prosecutors were scrutinizing his conduct before and after taking office. Now, who among us would not be embarrassed and enraged by the results of a two-year hunt by bloodthirsty investigators for anything that might weaken us or bring us down? The report indicates that the president was protected from himself by his aides who refused to carry out some of his orders, which might have constituted actual obstruction. So let me ask you this. Who doesn't throw everything on the table and consider every option when there is big decisions to be made? Have not other presidents in their private thoughts and words not considered every option? Did JFK not consider dropping the big one on the Soviet Union? Did Lincoln not consider sending slaves back to Africa? Did LBJ not speak in the most crude terms about other people and what he wants to do to them? Have any of us not thought about doing something which was ultimately a bad idea that we were talked out of that we ultimately didn't do? But the Trump haters want to punish the president for his thoughts and instincts, not for his actions. This is like the thought police. Would we all stand up to the scrutiny of the things we considered doing but didn't actually do? Like, for example, getting out of a car when another car's cut you off. 
You want to punch the guy out and you say it, but you don't ultimately do it. But be that as it may, those top 10 things done or said by Trump provide sufficient fodder for a revival of the left's faux outrage over something they know not to be true. Even their longtime lifeline in the Justice Department, Rod Rosenstein, concurred with Attorney General William Barr's decision on obstruction. But if the findings of three separate investigations all reaching the same conclusion, because remember, there were House and Senate probes as well, if those three are not enough to get them off the scent, well, nothing will. That is other than polls indicating an alarming level of disapproval of such a strategy by the American people. But the Democrats' point man, Jerry Nadler, who'll head up the Judiciary Committee investigation of obstruction, presumably, is intent on carrying on. Attorney General Barr appears to have shown an unsettling willingness to undermine his own department in order to protect President Trump. Barr's words and actions suggest he has been disingenuous and misleading in saying the president is clear of wrongdoing. So we go from collusion to obstruction and Bill Barr as a corrupt official doing Trump's bidding. But Trump well knows they've been out to get him by any means which avail themselves for almost four years now. Nothing you give them, whether it's Shifty Shift or Jerry Nadler... Anything we give them will never be enough. Disgraceful. There's never been anything like it in the history of our country. This should never happen to a president again. And really, it started long before that. It practically started from the time I came down the escalator because this was a whole uh, this was a whole plot. So the only question now is if Democrats choose to take the obstruction issue to the point of impeachment or simply continue to carry on with their usual attacks on him in the compliant elite media, or move on but keep this in their pockets to revive as an issue for the 2020 presidential election. But think about this. Obstruction of justice for a crime that was not committed, as affirmed by a 22-month-long investigation fueled by Trump-hating political partisanship, the likes of which we've never before witnessed. Really? The Mueller report affirms that the president was forthcoming in turning over all requested documents, provided unfettered access to files and individuals for interview, didn't claim executive privilege as he could have. He dismissed James Comey with full constitutional authority, and despite his instincts to fire Mueller as revealed in the report, he did not interfere with the investigation at any time or in any way. Of course, Democrats will harp on the president's refusal to be interviewed in person, but they know full well that that's a common legal strategy for avoiding a Michael Flynn-style perjury trap. This is especially true when you consider that it was alleged false statements during the investigation that generated all but one of the U.S. indictments produced by the special counsel, and that one exception, Paul Manafort, was convicted on multiple felony counts for financial crimes well before the Trump campaign. Only a fool could believe that Mueller didn't realize these 10 points would form the basis of Democratic talking points and investigations going forward. And from a political standpoint, the Dems may need to keep talking about exactly that, to shield themselves from the coming wrath of Attorney General William Barr's expanding investigation into the role of the Obama Justice Department and FBI in ginning up this special counsel probe which balkanized the country and crippled a duly elected president for two years. Now, special counsel investigations are biased by their very nature. They seek to find crimes, not to exonerate But consider how far Mueller was willing to go and what he revealed about himself in both the composition of his team of lawyers and the tactics he employed. This is a man who hired for his legal team one Jeannie Ray, a lawyer in the Hillary Clinton private email scandal who defended the Clinton Foundation as well. 
She donated $5,400 to Hillary for America in 2016. Mueller's most prominent appointment was Andrew Weissman, considered by most to be the most aggressive member of the Mueller legal team, even considered Mueller's lieutenant, a known Democratic activist who donated $2,300 to Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. And at least eight other members of his legal team also donated to the Clinton and or Obama campaigns. Mueller is also a man who thought it appropriate to conduct guerrilla-style military raids on Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, danger to the public that they are, and tossed Manafort into solitary confinement, all for crimes that had nothing to do with the counterintelligence investigation. Remember, this was not a criminal investigation, And unlike previous independent and special counsel investigations, no crime was even alleged when Mueller was appointed. Indeed, all of these indictments were for process crimes which occurred either during the special counsel investigation itself or before the indicted individual had joined the Trump campaign in the case of Paul Manafort. These facts alone suggest Robert Mueller was willing to go almost to the ends of the earth to produce something, anything, that could lead to the president's removal from office. He failed. But while he may not have delivered the goods on Trump, he certainly left a long enough trail of breadcrumbs for Democrats to gobble up and spit out for as long as anyone will listen. A lovely parting gift indeed. Quick break, and then we're back to examine a viable alternative theory on why the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. Was it because of Trump or Hillary? Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. As the fog clears over the persistent allegations that Donald Trump conspired with Russia to rig the 2016 presidential election, for which he's now been exonerated, we're left with the naked reality that the Trump haters in the political and media elite willfully ignored a theory on Russian interference that's actually far more plausible than some sort of single-minded effort by the Russians to help Trump get elected. Now, the Mueller report states unambiguously the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Now, what if this documented Russian meddling, resulting in some 25 indictments against Russian actors by Robert Mueller, none of whom will be brought to trial because they're in Russia, actually was aimed not at steering Trump to victory and turning him into a robotic pro-Russian Manchurian candidate, but at defeating Hillary Clinton at all costs. Now, there's ample evidence to suggest that then-Secretary of State Clinton's denunciation of the 2011 Russian election as fraudulent infuriated the victorious strongman Vladimir Putin to the point that he contemplated revenge against her impending presidential campaign in 2016. Consider this contemporaneous report from the New York Times back from 2011, quote, in a rare personal accusation, Mr. Putin said Mrs. Clinton had sent a signal to some actors in our country after Sunday's parliamentary elections. Mr. Putin said that hundreds of millions of dollars in foreign money was being used to influence Russian politics and that Mrs. Clinton had personally spurred protesters to action. I looked at the first reaction of our U.S. partners, Mr. Putin said. The first thing that the Secretary of State did was say that they were not honest and not fair, but she had not even yet received the material from the observers. 
Now, of course, as soon as Trump did the unthinkable and defeated Hillary Clinton, the shell-shocked American left and leftist political establishment with the aid and comfort of the Trump deranged media focused exclusively on how Trump must have cheated. They believed and still do to this day, Mueller report aside, that it simply was not possible that the American people would elect this vulgarian unless things were not on the level. And soon, the media felt the wind at their backs thanks to illicit investigations of Trump by the Obama Justice Department predicated, ironically, on a fake Russian dossier ordered up by the Clinton campaign. So the notion that Russian interference, most notably in the release of leaked emails day after day that became a form of Chinese water torture for Hillary's campaign was carried out for any reason other than helping Trump, was hardly considered. But the evidence of Putin's boiling hatred for Hillary was there all along in some of the media's own reporting, such as a story by Politico in July of 2016 titled, Why Putin Hates Hillary, with the subtitle, Behind the allegations of a Russian hack of the DNC is the Kremlin leader's fury at Clinton for challenging the fairness of Russian elections. It states categorically, quote, When mass protests against Russian President Vladimir Putin erupted in Moscow in December 2011, Putin made clear who he thought was really behind them, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, unquote. And then came the story's real money passage. Quote, Putin sees Clinton as a forceful proponent of regime change policies that the Russian leader considers a grave threat to his own survival. Now, if you think Putin would simply let bygones be bygones and allow Hillary to float unimpeded to an expected easy victory over Trump, well, I got some great property in the Everglades to sell you. It's entirely plausible, likely even, that Putin would have engineered the same beatdown on Hillary had the Republican nominee been Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush or anyone else. But would any GOP president other than Trump have set the political and media establishment on fire with conspiracy theories? Would the swampocracy have felt similarly threatened by the election of a conventional Republican politician to the point of fabricating a collusion hoax that consumed almost two years of the Trump presidency? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the answer. Sit tight, because coming up next, our signature segment, Say What?, featuring Nancy Pelosi on whether the Democrats have become a socialist party and the meteoric rise of the Democratic presidential candidate known as Mayor Pete. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. Now it is time for our signature segment, Say What, where we roll out some of the most wacky, astonishing, and damnable things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. As predictably as the sun rising in the east, the elite media made what they wanted of a special counsel report that resulted in a finding of no collusion between Trump and Russia by Mueller and no obstruction by the Attorney General Barr. But these elite media types said it was damning for the president and the Attorney General. Bill Barr has decided his legacy, he is fine with his legacy being the AG who took one for the team. It was an extraordinary 
political commercial for the president. A real black mark on his long and previously distinguished career. He blew it. He said precisely, Jake, what the president of the United States wanted to hear, no collusion. Is this something that we are supposed to see from the attorney general of the United States, not the attorney general of the president uh, of the United States? Of course States? not. That was Brian Williams and Andrea Mitchell of MSNBC, Jeffrey Tubin, Dana Bash, and Wolf Blitzer of CNN. They didn't like the findings, so they attacked the messenger and called him corrupt, as they always do when it comes to Trump and anyone who was appointed by him. As if attorneys general are not always appointed by and thus essentially loyal to the president. Were Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch any less loyal to Barack Obama than Barr is to Trump? But you knew how the Democrats would react to the Mueller report well before it was even released. Exhibit A, left-wing Congressman Steve Cohen of Tennessee went on MSNBC before the report was released, using the disastrous fire at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris this week to accentuate the Democrats' promise to go beyond obstruction in their investigations into every aspect of Trump's life. I think there's a case for obstruction. There's a case for emoluments violation. I filed articles last last year. I haven't brought them up this year, but we're getting so far along in seeing what this president has done and what he's done to the Constitution, what he's done to the people's respect for our government. Uh, what he has done to the Constitution and the rule of laws is, is as bad as that fire did to Notre Dame. And those rats are going to do all they can to stop the American people from knowing what they've been up to and what they've done to our Constitution. But as Mueller mania carries on... The Democrats have a presidential race to run amidst the question of whether the extreme positions of their candidates on issues like the Green New Deal and government controlled health care and reparations for the descendants of slaves. Their party has become full on socialist, inspired by the 29 year old Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And Nancy Pelosi went on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl and tried to deny it. You have these wings, AOC and her group on one side. Well, it's like five people. No, it's the progressive group. It's more than well, the five. Progressive, I'm a progressive, yeah. By and large, uh, whatever orientation they came to Congress with, they know that we have to hold the center, that we have to go down the mainstream. They know that? They do. I do reject socialism as an economic system. If people have that view, that's their view. That is not the view of the Democratic Party. Or is it? Does Pelosi even control the party anymore? Is she even in a position to assure voters of that? One of the presidential candidates who's risen to prominence out of nowhere is one Pete Buttigieg the gay mayor of South Bend, Indiana, who's married to another man and has come to be known as Mayor Pete, and he's the new darling of the elite media, particularly those never-Trump Republicans resentful of how Trump has rendered them irrelevant. Audacity of hope, a 37-year-old Indiana mayor with a speech that many have said are historic. Everybody stopped. They were watching Tiger. And they watched Mayor Pete. What you saw yesterday in South Bend was good. What was the magic in in the space? We saw heroes yesterday. We saw two heroes and people saying, I this did. guy is the real thing. We love Mayor Pete. Vision's I love Mayor Pete. I'm literally <laughs> in love with him. My mom loves Mayor Pete. <laughs> this guy is chicken soup for my soul. Because I've been so impressed, <laughs> more and more impressed every day. I'm thrilled that he's caught fire. The, the second coming of Obama, huh? The unpronounceable name, now a household name. Among the voices there, Joy Behar of The View, plus Joe Scarborough and Nicole Wallace of MSNBC, one-time Republicans now obedient supplicants to the elite media and their leftist worldview. Now, Mayor Pete has burst on the scene mostly by being a sea of calm in an ocean of chaos and sounding reasonable. But when you drill down beyond the surface, Buttigieg believes most of the same things as his fellow Democrats about fundamentally transforming America a la Barack Obama. So most Americans don't want the conservative agenda that we're now seeing, the extreme agenda that we're, we're seeing in Washington. In fact, it is precisely for that reason 
that they have to interfere with democracy, with things like voter suppression or clinging on an electoral college that overrules the will of the American people. It is precisely because the American people, by and large, don't want what they're selling. Even though they elected Trump, apparently unaware of what he stood for. But there you go, the supposedly reasonable, moderate Pete Buttigieg carrying on about voter suppression, the Republicans' extreme agenda, and wanting to abolish the Electoral College sounds pretty much the same as the other 17 Democrat presidential candidates. Finally, it looks like Donald Trump will have someone running against him for the Republican nomination, the liberal Republican turned libertarian, turned Republican again, former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld. I think it's good for the country to have somebody put the president to his proofs, as it were, maybe ask him some why questions, like why do you think it's good to insult our military allies? Why do you praise dictators? Is it because you wish the United States uh, was more dictatorial? I'm afraid that might be the case. So the never-Trump Republicans have their man, someone who will ignore the record of the president, the roaring economy, record low unemployment, soaring consumer and business confidence, massive deregulation and the like, and focus only on Trump's uncivilized behavior so they can return the GOP to its rightful place as civilized losers. So just how damning are those top ten things that together could have been considered obstruction of justice, which Democrats will hang their hat on from now to kingdom come? LibertyNation.com Legal Affairs Editor Scott Cosenza has written a definitive piece on this, and we'll bring him on to discuss and analyze in just a moment. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. So where do Democrats go from here with the revelations in the Mueller report? Is there any there there in Democrat claims that Trump broke the law somehow, some way? Did Donald Trump display corrupt intent or not? For these crucial questions in the aftermath of the release of the over 400-page Mueller report, we bring in LibertyNation.com Legal Affairs Editor Scott Cosenza, who's written a definitive piece on the 10 items on the Democrats' obstruction checklist entitled, Obstruction Hunting Season Opens, No Bag Limit. Thank you uh, for that title, Scott. Every once in a while, you make I, I yeah. do make a good one. I appreciate that. Firstly, I think you should announce how I've distinguished myself by reading at least most of volume yes, two you. of the report, unlike probably everybody else who's commenting about this uh, out there in the world. Yeah, and there's a lot of derivative commentary, yes. to be sure. Uh, let's start by having you parse this term corrupt intent. Now, Barr says Trump had no corrupt intent. Democrats, of course, say he did. How is corrupt intent defined and how is it determined? OK, so this is one of those frustrating things that we can't give a direct and clear answer to uh, to say, oh, well, then we apply the test and he meets the test or he doesn't. Um, the uh, the obstruction of justice statute uh, includes corruptly defined as uh, acting with an improper purpose, personally or by influencing another, including making a false or misleading statement or withholding, concealing, altering, or destroying a document or other information. So the same act, Tim, can be done. In other words, you can fire Jim Comey if you're Donald Trump and do so and that had not implicate uh, obstruction of justice or any criminal thing. And the, again, now, so this is, uh, by the way, Mr. Mueller's perspective I'm giving. Right, right? understood. You can fire uh, James Comey and not have it uh, be improper or illegal. And you can do the same exact act in the same way, meaning the same time of day that you fire him, the same day, the same words that you use. But because of your intent in that act, if, for instance, it is to frustrate an ongoing investigation, again, this is Mr. Mueller's point of view, then it can be um, illegal obstruction of justice by the president of the United States. So that's what the Mueller sort of – I was surprised that Mr. Mueller spent so much of his report kind of getting into that. In other words, getting into the points where Mueller thinks that the president can be prosecuted in this way. What, as you see it, is the most troubling part of this report for the president from a legal standpoint? Do you count um, 
a potential impeachment uh, bill as a legal issue? Because no, we're that's, just a talking political, about, that's a political okay. issue. Well, then nothing. Um, the, if President uh, Trump ceases to become President Trump and then the next president – uh, wishes to see him prosecuted for some of these. That, I think, is the only potential uh, that we'll have. And, of course, I think that the likelihood, unless it's Hillary Clinton herself, <laughs> the appetite for that uh, will probably be very, very low if he's no longer president. It seems like if he's out of power, I, I, I sort of doubt they'll, they'll continue to go after him. But that's where the danger would be, that Mueller himself says in the report, in fact, he, he says... So Mueller determines that it would be inappropriate for him to bring criminal charges against the president of the United States for obstruction due to a internal uh, ruling, Uh, basically this part of this rules that govern when prosecutors can bring charges. That was a rule established under the Clinton Justice Department. General Reno and her staff uh, brought this rule up. So but he says that he's mindful that even if that rule didn't exist. Right. That the a criminal prosecution of the president might forestall or, or, or preempt, I believe is the word he uses, uh, constitutional processes. So that means impeachment. In fact, he mentions impeachment in the footnote. Right. So, it's a, he says the indictment of criminal prosecution of a sitting right. president would unconstitutionally right. undermine the capacity of the executive branch to perform yes. its constitutionally assigned functions but but as you say well, he, importantly he goes beyond that to say that that trump was cleared of obstruction not only because he's a right. sitting president and he says that prosecutions can be brought after somebody's out of office so he's he, he's laying the foundation right in the document that maybe this guy will be prosecuted later and so we're going to get this and and, and so even though the justice department regulations tim forbid a criminal prosecution of the president on obstruction grounds. They don't forestall or preclude a a criminal investigation. And so Mueller says that's right. why we conducted this investigation. And maybe and he doesn't use these colloquial terms, but maybe you'll go ahead and prosecute him after he leaves. Now, I talked about from a legal standpoint what uh, the most troubling part of this report for the president. But what the special counsel did was he basically referred the matter of obstruction to Congress, in essence. So now... Congress is queued up to take the ball and run down the field with it. It's like Mueller set it up for them that way, almost like it was, as I describe it, a lovely parting gift for the Democrats. So from a legal standpoint, an investigation will ensue almost to be sure from Jerry Nadler's House Judiciary Committee. But what are the potential consequences of that in terms of referring uh, to the Justice Department for indictments, okay, so for example. I want to take a little bit of an issue with the way you put referred to Congress, because mm-hmm. I, I find it, and I know that you don't have this this problem, but I, I find out there in the world there's a fair amount of ignorance in terms of who can actually bring a criminal charge in the United States of America. Now, I didn't mean legally referring. Right, right. But, but, I, but I want to clear instance. up the point yes, because yes, I think that there, may, there can be confusion in, in this Under, area. Understood. Only the executive branch of government, federally in the Department of Justice, can bring criminal charges. Congress cannot do so. Congress can refer, as you say, which is basically writing a letter to the Department of Justice saying, please prosecute this person. Well, as long as the head of the Justice Department is Donald Trump uh, or his appointee, that's not going to happen. They're not going to um, they're not going to file criminal charges against Donald Trump. It's not going to happen. So. Therefore, there is no problem. In other words, unless and until new persons occupy those offices with the capacity to to, uh, to prosecute him and the will to do so. Right so, now, so it's it's moved fully out of the legal realm and into the political realm where the Democrats can do whatever they see fit to do. Let's get. I to, think that's fair to say, except that it could go back to legal if a new president comes in. Understood. Now, let's get to what you wrote about uh, the Democrats obstruction hunting season and the 10 things listed as possible indications of obstruction uh, that was placed in the report by Mueller as uh, as what I call the lovely parting gift. The Democrats culminating with the untraditional decision by Mueller to punt the issue of obstruction rather than decide on it. Break this down for us. Well, he says right at the outset, because of that ruling, because of that memorandum uh, written by a Clinton 
uh, assistant attorney general, who, by the way, was later appointed to the federal bench by Barack Hussein Obama, just so we're clear that it wasn't some Republican insider deal, you know, to help Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. This is from 2000. Um, Because they were accepting the case under the Justice Department guidelines, that's what gives Mueller his power, um, that he had to follow that guideline, too. And that guideline says that it would be unconstitutional. Again, okay, this is Mm -hmm. (laughs) the policy of the senior attorneys in the Clinton Justice Department. Um, also left alone by everyone in the Bush uh, Justice Department uh, and the Obama Justice Department, right? So every Justice Department since this rule was invented by the Clinton Justice Department hasn't touched it. And it said it would be unconstitutional, violative of separation of powers to try to prosecute the president for obstruction of justice. Again, the president can't go out and, you know, hold up a liquor store. We're not talking about him being beyond the reach of the law for <laughs> right. that, okay? Or but, parking tickets. But because the, the the prosecution decisions themselves are part of the office, that he can't <laughs> improperly execute that power. And that, that's – there's no – there can be no corruption in the decision to fire Jim Comey because it's part of his job to make sure that the office of the FBI is properly run. And if he wants Jim Comey fired for whatever reason, that's beyond our review. It is appropriate for Congress to review it in in an impeachment capacity if they choose, but it's not appropriate for uh, lessers at the Department of Justice to review it for criminal uh, prosecution. Okay, so on this list, you've got, uh, to list them quickly, the campaign's response to reports about Russian support for Trump, conduct involving Comey and Flynn, reaction to the investigation, the president's termination of Comey, the appointment of a special counsel, efforts to remove him to cur- and to curtail the special counsel's investigation, efforts to prevent disclosure of evidence, and a few other things, including one with Michael Cohen. Are any of these things that there's likely to be more fire behind the smoke? Well, just because there's 10, I think that by by the very nature, some are weaker than others. Uh, I wrote one sentence uh, summaries of these 10 things. Robert Mueller wrote as many as 20 pages on, on each one in terms of the detail that he went into. And I think mm-hmm. the, um, the Flynn, uh, the conduct involving Mr. Michael Flynn, perhaps, uh, may be a little bit tricky for Donald Trump. If you believed him, again, that the president can obstruct justice in that way. I think that uh, I hold the opinion that was advanced by the president's counsel and advanced by Alan Dershowitz before that. I think he's the first person I heard uh, say this is that for questions about the office themselves, like the hiring of a or firing of an FBI agent or the decision to prosecute a Michael Flynn. So Michael Flynn lied. That was his crime, right, just to be clear. He didn't commit treason right. or anything like that. He lied to federal investigators. And Donald Trump basically said, you know what, enough bad stuff's happened to the guy. Why don't you go ahead and leave him alone? Not because he was afraid that Flynn was going to give dirt about Donald Trump, right. which would be a corrupt reason, right? This has nothing to do with that. And Donald Trump is the prosecutor in chief. He is the chief executive. So while we may disagree with that decision, I don't think it was it, you could say that it's inappropriate for him to make that decision based on certain reasoning rather than others. The appropriate thing is for the Congress if he did so, if the people demand that the Congress remove the president, then that's that's the mechanism we have if the president behaves that way. The the ordinary sort of obstruction of justice criminal laws are not designed to be applied in this fashion. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott, and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, a civilized podcast with Mark Angelides, LibertyNation.com, managing editor, not that Scott is uncivilized. Thank you, Tim. It's available online anytime, anywhere, on demand at LibertyNation.com. So that is it for this week, but we will be back at you next week, same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying stand up for liberty, and we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio.